Welcome to season two of Self Careish. It's selfish with care. I'm Megan, your host, and each week I spend about 20 minutes to an hour unpacking different ways to fill your cup after a divorce, or if you're on a dating or self dating journey. Either way, enjoy and let's get into it. We're getting pretty close to the finale of season two of the pod. After which, I am going to take a two-week break, but I wanted to let you know that I will still be recording and sharing on the official substack for the show. I call it the self care Society. You could just call it the newsletter community. Anyway, so while I'll be having a two-week break from posting, I will be using that time to organize fresh interviewees and also fresh pontification and musing on the wonders of being divorced or selfish with care. So head on over to substack.com slash at selfcareish. Don't be afraid. Follow along there. All the links are in the show notes. Let's get into it. I'm really excited about this week's episode because you and I get to riff on a topic that I have been meditating on for a little while, and that is the glamour surrounding the concept of divorce that's happening these days. And before we plunge into the deep end, let me toss a disclaimer your way. In this episode, we are not diving into the heavy trauma-driven divorces or the ones where someone's making a desperate escape from a truly messed up situation. That is a whole universe on its own. And I promise I am going to dedicate a weightier episode to that in season three, like give it the time that it deserves. But this one is more about the lighter side of divorces. Although let's not kid ourselves, guys, nobody gets out of a marriage without a few emotional scrapes and bruises, to put it lightly. But here's the kicker. There's a thing happening at the moment. And I hate using the word trend, so scratch that. It's more like a movement, a vibe, a shift in the air surrounding the concept of divorce. I'm going to call it the self care divorce, just to be cute. But the French call it Divorce par consentement mutuel, or something like that. (laughs) Americans call it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And however you package it up, it looks like this. Someone, whatever gender, takes a big, giant, bird's eye view over their relationship, their life, their marriage, and evaluates if constant arguments and a general hum of hopelessness and dissatisfaction gels with their ultimate life's purpose or the life's purpose of their partner as well. It sounds, I know, a little bit like a midlife crisis, but I don't think there is a single marriage on the planet that hasn't come to a crisis point at some point. But if you do know someone out there who has never gone through a tough time in their relationship, please do let me know. I wanna interview them for you. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say something that you might disagree with. I don't think midlife crises exist anymore. And what I'm getting at is regardless of your age or stage in life, we are all in this perpetual state of flux when it comes to our identities and self-assurance. In your 20s, you are scrambling to carve out something meaningful for yourself. Then fast forward to your 30s and it's all about playing house and following the rule book to set yourself up financially for the impending 40s. And the 40s is the age when you realize you might be too old for youthful shenanigans and you are too young for seasoned wisdom. And as millennials, I feel like we feel this even harder. Our generation has only known change and transition just by default. We are the generation that grew up with the concept of software updates and upgrading your phone every two years, or we've gotten used to the concept of perpetually renting slash borrowing someone's house for a period of time, because as you know, home ownership is out of reach for many young millennials who I think are 27 now. Anyway, the borrowing and giving back and moving on somewhere else, like it's just, it's a never ending dance of transition and flow. The boat is never steady and it's always 
rocking on waves of change. And if we establish that everybody on the planet is constantly evolving, then it just makes sense that our traditions and relationships will too. Like I recently said on my Instagram, um, never was a truer sentence spoken than when Will Smith described his marriage to Jada as a sloppy public experiment in unconditional love, which I actually think is a very beautiful way to describe a modern marriage because things move fast today and even fashion forecasters have completely ditched the 30-year trend cycle. You know that thing where your clothes come back every 30 years? Now we just have micro trend after micro trend. And I could go down a whole rabbit hole on that, but let's get back to the glamorous divorce concept. I feel Emily Ratajkowski, you know, divorcee slash supermodel, also summed it up really beautifully with this. So it seems that a lot of ladies are getting divorced before they turn 30. And as someone who got married at 26, has been separated for a little over a year, 32, I have to tell you, I don't think there's anything better. If being in your 20s is the trenches, there is nothing better than being in your 30s, still being hot, maybe having a little bit of your own money, figuring out what you want to do with your life, everything, and having tried that married fantasy and realizing that it's maybe not all it's cracked up to be, and then you've got your whole life still ahead of you. Um, so for all of those people who are stressed or feeling stressed about that, about being divorced, like, it's, a, it's, it's good. Congratulations. Congratulations. I mean, could she get any more? Amazing. But anyway, countless of women responded to that statement with a resounding yes. Because being single in your 30s is a very distinctly golden feeling. Like she says, you're still hot. And I actually think you can be hot at any age. Actually, that's a great episode idea for season three. But you have a little more money. You have your entire life ahead of you to build it the way you want. And often you're very grateful to your ex-partner at the same time. You're grateful that you got married and you had that experience, albeit as traumatic as the tough side was, because you might have kids and a little human or humans that you love. And that is such a brilliant blessing. Or you might not have had kids. And that may also be a blessing in its own way, because then you're truly free to explore the furthest reaches of the planet. <sighs> Go to New York live in Bali, buy a goddamn boat if you want and take it to the Bahamas. Actually, speaking of boats and divorce and freedom to be yourself, that brings me neatly to today's interviewee, Hannah Stella, who you might know if you're as chronically online as me. She's a writer, a raconteur, and a full-blown ambassador for living your truth after divorce. She also did live on a boat in the Bahamas for a while. And as soon as I connected with her, I realized she is the perfect person to bring on the show to dissect where we're all at with this marriage thing in 2023, rolling into 2024. So enjoy. So Hannah, thank you so much for being here. I know you as one of TikTok's most prolific raconteurs about pop culture and life after a breakup, but you're also a writer of personal essays and you have a sub stack and pretty much anything else, you know, that resonates. How do you describe yourself to people? So it sort of depends. In real life, like if I'm interacting with people in person, I call myself a writer. I think of myself sort of primarily as a writer. I make most of my income from Substack and I'm working really hard on some novels and stuff now. And so that's, to me, I'm a writer. And then I say, and I do, I do some social media stuff and I have, I have a platform that I, that I also, I also do that. Um, in publications, I usually say I'm a writer and content creator. I don't know. Really? It's a weird, it's a very weird thing having an internet presence uh, to me because it's such a big part of like the, not that I'm a big part of the internet, but my online personality, which is my same personality, but my online presence is so much of my experience of the internet, but it really sort of 
only exists on the internet. Do you know what I mean? I think so. Do you mean the internet is becoming very much more of our real lives? So I actually, I think the internet is becoming our real lives more, but I have found that the more that I have a professional life on the internet, the less the internet feels like part of my real life. Ah, interesting. It's funny because when I meet people, the internet feels like a really big thing. And to me, the internet feels... Uh, I, I mean, I love the internet and I feel so lucky to work on the internet, but it feels like my job. So you've separated that in your mind. Yeah, it was it was pretty unintentional, actually. But just sort of the more um, the more I've been online, it just I don't I don't know exactly. I don't know why I can't explain it. Well, I usually am pretty articulate. But um, yeah, the more I've been online, the more it just feels like less of my day to day real life. It feels, I think I naturally compartmentalized it. I think that, I think that actually, if you're working on the internet, then if you're also sort of centering your real life around the internet, it can be very difficult to, um, like stay mentally clear. And so I think that, I think that I kind of involuntarily, but necessarily have separated them. Yes. It's funny. I would argue that the generation that's coming up behind us is learning so well how to compartmentalize their digital life versus their real life. But then, you know, people are sharing a lot more personal things than they ever have before. So I don't know, maybe it's a character persona that people put on, but to also share real things. That's, it's true. Um, It is true. Well, I think it's kind of like... I think that the way conversations go and the way that people react to things on the internet is because when we consume content online, we're kind of often by ourselves, right? Maybe you see something and you send it to a friend, but the way that I think that the way that people consume content is a very personal way, whether, whether that means that something offends them or they think it's funny, it's because of how they personally relate to it. And I think that whenever we interact with people in real life, it's a lot more um, interactive. I I mean, it's literally interactive because it's interaction. I think that even though I share a lot online and um, I certainly write very personal essays, I think written word also feels very, very detached from me in in a way, even though it's, it's extremely, extremely personal. I think if I realized how, how much of my personal business I was sharing sort of emotionally, I'd probably stop. But um, I, I think that, you know, when something exists as a piece of work, whether it's like a TikTok or an essay or something, it's like I've said my statement and now people are reacting to that. Whereas if I'm speaking to somebody, we're having a conversation. And so it's just a very different, um, it's a very different relationship as honest and authentic as all of my essays and content are, and, and they really are, um, it, it kind of just, it just feels like, okay, I said what was true. I put it out there and now how people feel about it is not something that I can take on. Whereas in my personal life, if I say something that somebody disagrees with, um, or, or that they, if they feel like I'm being too neurotic or too self-indulgent, I, I take that very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And it is funny because I feel like I could do a whole episode with you talking about this phenomenon of what's real life, what's fake life, what's digital life, and the merging of all of it. But that actually segs pretty beautifully into how I discovered you, which was via the all-powerful algorithm um and it was your video stuff i wish i'd known when i got divorced and everything you said was so true (laughs) like when you said that there are men who come out of the woodwork who try to sleep with you or there are friends whose marriages are in a difficult place and they stop speaking to you or and then there are younger guys who are into divorced women like what is all of that about do you think i i think the young guy thing is I mean, I don't know. I've never been a man, but I think it must be that there's something like 
that seems very sophisticated about being divorced. Like, I, I, I think it's kind of sophisticated. I mean, it'd probably be more sophisticated to be able to make your marriage work, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think there's something kind of alluring and sophisticated about it. And then I think that, uh, I think that also people feel that if somebody just got divorced, they're like up for an adventure. And, um, they're probably, it's probably not like a horrible bet. A lot of my divorced, I mean, I, I have several divorced friends and I think many of them are like, yeah, I just wanted to have fun for a while. What about the friends you mentioned whose marriages were in trouble and they kind of stopped talking to you? Um, I had, I think two experiences with that, but maybe, maybe one, it's a little hard to know. Uh, and at first it was quite hurtful though. It also happened when I was really in the midst of being divorced uh, or getting divorced. And so that was kind of at the forefront of my emotions. And then I just kind of understood. I was like, this really has nothing to do with me. Um, it, it really is about them. And I just dispositionally, I'm not somebody who, um, that doesn't make me angry. It makes me sad, but I, 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 I really in a very human way understand why that was the choice that that friend made. And I, I have a lot of empathy for it. I just don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't want to have the disposition to the world where I feel like completely aggrieved by everybody who's wronged me. I am an egotistical person. Everybody's egotistical and like people's behavior and people's reactions to you are about, about them as much as they're about you. And, um, I think because I naturally have a really big personality and a really big ego, I try and be very careful to remind myself that like nobody else is thinking about me. And if somebody is taking distance, that's about them. And that's not, it's not a judgment. Um, cause I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know if she was right to stay. I don't know if I was right to leave. I feel good about it. I feel good about my choice, but I, I can't say that that was the right choice for everybody. And I understand how, there are certain relationships that you can't have if you're choosing that relationship, you know? It's hurtful. It's it's very hurtful. But it's it's not something that I that I personally dwelled on. Though I I don't I don't know that I don't know that I I think I think that might be um I I don't know. No, I totally get it. Um it's really interesting that you shared that because something my sister and I talk about a lot and she's divorced also. Her, our mom and dad are very proud. <laughs> but we would joke that divorce is catching. It's kind of like an infectious disease and not in a bad way. Sometimes it's in a good way. But for example, I remember when I was married and people would tell me, "Oh, they're getting divorced." the overwhelming feeling that I would have was envy. And I'd be like, what, you're choosing you? How, can you do that? Can we do that? And maybe it was a case of that with your friend. Yeah, I, people, I've, I've heard about this, about like divorce clusters and stuff and like, oh, does one divorce cause other divorces? And I think, I, I suspect that what happens is like, people go, okay, well, if they're not gonna put up with this anymore, then neither am I. Um, versus I, I, I think it's impossible for a divorce, not impossible, but I think it's, I think it's very, very rare for a friend getting divorced to harm or sort of mortally wound a good, a good marriage that's going well. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm just not mad at my friend. I, I understand she should not be married to her husband. She's staying. I know that then I shouldn't be going on podcasts and saying that, but nobody knows, nobody knows who she is. She's not going to listen to this. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, and I understand that like, she still felt that, that being in that relationship was the best choice for her. And maybe she won't always feel that way, but I get that. Like it's, it's really, I, I, I sort of realized if my life goes really, really well and we're friends 
And she's looking at it like, wow, if I had made the same choice, like maybe my life would be going like that. That would be really hard. But then also think of the alternative. What if I crash and burn and everything's terrible? And then she loses the hope that like, I, I, I mean, and this sounds so like me focused. I, I, I don't mean it like that. I just mean like, if you, if you see somebody who makes a choice that you've been thinking about making and that choice goes poorly, then you're in this situation where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so unhappy where I am. And now I feel like I have this window into the, into the other side and that's not happy either. And so I really understand why you'd be like, I just can't, I, I, I can't see the way this story ends. It's too scary for me. Does that make sense? That's, that's what I think it is. And that is a lot of me assuming how other people feel, which perhaps we shouldn't do, but it's almost what I do professionally. <laughs> Not, I don't have a degree, but I speculate. No, I think you're speculating right in a sense. Like there, that there is this like unspoken pressure on divorced people or women maybe more to live your commas best life. You know, maybe it's an unspoken thing of maybe wanting to show other people that it's possible, but also it's kind of exactly what you said and needing to represent and stand up for single life and say, this is possible for you if you're unhappy. Yeah, it, 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 it is interesting. And I, I like being single more than I actually thought that I would like being single. You know, sometimes I'll make like sort of jokey dating content and then it'll, it'll end up on men's pages, which um, I, I, I really I really make content for not for heterosexual men. Uh, but sometimes it comes across their desk and um, they're like, oh, with that attitude, like nobody's ever going to want you. And I'm like, that's literally fine. Like, I like this attitude. I like having this attitude. And if nobody else likes this attitude, that's I, I I'm an island then, baby. Like, I, I just don't care. And so I, yeah, but I think there is, there's, I think what you were kind of touching on and correct me if I'm wrong, I think there really is this, this sort of thing where if you get divorced and then you don't get married again, that like you've sort of messed up or like that, that, that would be really sad. And I don't think it's necessarily sad. Definitely not sad at all. In fact, I'd argue a lot of the world is set up for single people more than couples these days, which is different than what it was 30, 40 years ago. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, I want to get more into that. But before we do, I forgot to ask you up front, how long have you been divorced? Uh, I have been divorced a little over a year. I got divorced on, uh, legally divorced on August 30th of 2022. And uh, we broke up pretty shortly before that. We got divorced very, very quickly. What about you? Oh, um, we separated in May, June last year. So now we're just over 12 months um, separated because in Australia, you have to wait a year before you can file for divorce just to, I guess, make sure we're all certain about it. <laughs> But we're probably, you and I are probably pretty similar in terms of time scales. But I wanted to also ask you, have you had any other big realizations of life after marriage? Like, for instance, I know you bought a boat and lived on it in the Bahamas for a while. And my face when I saw you did that, like I was sitting here like, what is the desire to buy a boat a universal divorce experience? Because that was immediately what I wanted to do. Like, why do you think we all want to live on boats after marriage? And why did you leave boat life too? Warn us before we all go buy boats. I think your Australian might be coming out a little bit. There are so many Aussies on boats. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess I think that there's, so do you know what I think it is? I think that there's this feeling of like, um, I don't want to live well, this is how I felt. And then I, in hindsight, I was completely wrong because I don't feel that this is like a B minus version of that life. But I really felt like, oh, I don't want to go from living like my life that I was living as a married person to like a B minus version of that. So I'm going to live a different life. And I was like, I love boats. I love the summer. And that's all true. But like, I think there is this impulse to be like, I'm going to do something different. Did you feel that? Did you do yeah. anything crazy different? Yeah, I got a nose job and a boob job, which is very different to what I would have done in my married life. It's funny, I built both those things up to read these really 
big things, but after doing them, I'm like, oh, that wasn't as scary or as big as I thought that was going to be. Are boat you life. happy you did it? Oh, yeah. Happy I did it? Yeah. But tell me about boat life. <laughs> I mean, it was it was not for me. Boat life was really, really, it's like camping. I, I mean, I live, I live in very populated area of one of the most populated, uh, the most populated city in America. Like I, I like creature comforts and conveniences and it just, I'm just a very, like my, I'm just a very kind of New York. I've been in New York my whole adult life and that's really like where I belong. Um, so that's kind of why I left. It just really wasn't for me. Um, but I am very glad that I did it. I actually, are you, well, I don't want to ask you that. I booked a nose job when I was getting off the boat and then I canceled it because I was like, Hannah, you are not going to change your face. That's like, that's not a smart thing to do right now, but that doesn't I, mean it I, wasn't I, smart for you to do it. It just wasn't it was coming. It was coming from a place for me where it wasn't smart. That's not a, that very sincerely is not a judgment. No, I know what you mean. And I did go back and forth with something like that through all throughout my twenties, but what I think happens when you get plastic surgery or anyone does, it is we all have these like default insecurities that we have with our personalities or our bodies. And then what plastic surgery does is it takes that one insecurity off your plate. But because the human mind is the way it is, usually something else will come and slot into that place. So sure, my nose is off my plate and I'm happy about that. Like, but you know, I'm still like a total ball of like insecurities and things that bug me. It never really ends. So you just have to be mindful of that, I guess, when you, not you, but anyone who does surgery. It sounds like you'd wanted to do it. I never had an issue with my nose. And then I started being on the internet and people would make comments about my nose sometimes. Um, or just I, people, people tell me I'm ugly on the internet all the time. Not all the time. I, I don't, I don't mean it like that. I mean, if you are a woman who exists on the internet, not infrequently, people will make mean comments about the way that you look. Um, I actually don't feel that I get it outsized. I, I, I know some other people, they get it much, much more than I do. And I think it's, I think it's horrible all the time. But so for me, when I was thinking about doing it, it wasn't, it wasn't really coming from a place of like, I want to fix it because the internet, it was coming from a place of like, Oh, I never noticed, but perhaps we could like tweak this a little bit. And then I was like, this has never been an insecurity for you. It's never upset you. And like, I do think there's something to kind of the, um, the like, Hadid model of like, even if you like something about your face, like you could make these like sort of micro adjustments. But I was like, you don't need to be doing that right now. Like just have your real face. Like, look, even Bella Hadid, who is, was beautiful before surgery and after surgery, she still posts selfies crying and dealing with depression. So, you know, it, it's true for everybody. Actually, speaking of celebrities, I want to touch on a meme that I have a feeling you'll have a lot to say about. And you know, it's the one called the Mount Rushmore of women's headlines. And I'll link to it in the show notes for people who haven't seen it. But it's all these headlines from older actresses and models about loving being single. So for instance, it's got Linda Evangelista saying she's not interested in dating because she doesn't want to hear someone breathing in bed next to her. And then there's Kim Cattrall saying, I don't want to be in a situation for an hour where I'm not enjoying myself. And Whoopi Goldberg saying, I just don't want anybody in my house. And I guess, what do you think? Are we in a divorce bubble or is there something happening in the zeitgeist around relationships right now? I think that people have always felt that way. And only recently has it been fine for women to sort of feel like they can say it or, or maybe they were saying it and nobody was writing it down. Right. Like you can say anything to a reporter and then it's just what they like decide to. Um, and I think that most reporters try and like have the integrity of the conversation. I don't, I don't mean to attack journalists, but like, I, I, I think it's, I think it's not a new feeling. I think it's a new conversation. I, don't know how I feel like maybe you're right like the people are now deciding what is the conversation instead of the media and I guess the media is just responding to what the people have been humming about for decades but the hum is getting louder and louder and louder because people are 
amplifying the message through social media. But do you think that's going to kill marriage? I'm still pretty pro-marriage. I don't know if I'll get married again, but I, I think marriage is nice. I, I think that there's something really nice about marriage. And I think that having a partner is a very like normal human impulse. I don't think, I think that what will happen, what I hope happens and what I think will happen personally is that we'll kind of reach a place where everybody can kind of be who they are and, and kind of try and pursue the life that's right for them. And I think that that'll mean that a lot of people get married. And I think it'll also mean that some people choose not to, or get divorced and choose not to marry again, or choose not to date. I don't know. Are you dating? Do you date? I, I do. Yeah, I've uh, stopped dating because I just have not met a single normal guy off a dating app. In fact, two times this year, I've received DMs from two women saying I've inadvertently slept with their husbands or boyfriends because the guys were on apps and they were actually in a relationship. And when I tell you I wanted to vomit, I still want to vomit. It's disgusting. And the women and I became friends though, so that's nice. But yeah, I'm pretty disgusted with some of the app culture. I don't know. What's your experience been like? Tell me. Tell me good stuff. I don't use apps. I quit. I use them a little bit uh, and I quit in September. Um, I just feel like it's so... I mean, I am in a very unique situation in that I live in like a neighborhood with a lot of like restaurants and bars and like things to do in a major city. And so I understand that like this is only from my perspective, but I find it very easy to just if you just go to dinner and sit at the bar, you'll meet people. If you go to a friend's party, you'll meet people. If you go like, I don't know, I, I, I. I had enough success meeting people out that I was like, I think I would rather do this. This online thing makes you really jaded. Totally. And I, I also think you're really lucky because whenever I've been in America, something that's always amazed me is the sheer boldness of the men there. Like they are confident and they will come up and chat to you. And in Australia, I'll just tell you, it's very rare oh. for guys to do that unless you have friends in common. That's interesting. I have never been there. I think of Australians as sort of, I, I think that there are some cultural differences between Australians and Americans. I didn't know that the dating one was one. I actually watched an interview with Jason Bateman once and he was talking about going to Australia and he was like, yeah, I was excited, but I kind of wasn't because Australia is just like America light. And it's kind of true. So I don't know how much you're missing out on. Anyway, let's get back on track. Do you have any different prerequisites for people to date since you've been married? Um, I think that my mental checklist has actually changed a relatively small amount. Um, I don't know that I had like a, I think that by reputation, I think people think that I have a much larger mental checklist than I do. I think that's changed very little, but I think that how I, what my priorities are for like interpersonal interaction has changed a lot. You know, before I was married, I was always somebody who was very accommodating of my partners. And I was like a real people pleaser. And now I just am really comfortable being myself. And if somebody doesn't like something about, I mean, certainly I have flaws. And if somebody says like, you do this thing that's really annoying and can you work on that? I, um, I, I probably will if it's like something that I agree I need to work on, but I just am so I'm like, Oh, okay. Like if you don't like my sense of humor, then like, you just don't like me that much. And that's fine. We don't have to date. Or like, if you don't like my, um, I'm very outgoing. I talk to everybody. Uh, and I, I am kind of a big flirt and that bothers some people. And I'm just like, yeah, but that's like who I am. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything bad, but I, I like, I like speaking to people. I like talking to different kinds of people. And if you don't want to, every time we go out, not every time, but like if we're out in a, in an atmosphere that's social, if you would rather just like talk to the woman you're with, I really understand that, but that's not what I'm going to do. And so 
you know, kind of take it. I, I think I'm much more take it or leave it than I was, which as people have pointed out, might mean that I stay single. And that is, that's fine. I don't know. It's fine. Either one is fine. Okay. Well, getting to the pointy end now, but what are your tips for someone who's just come out of a marriage and they want to get back into dating? You Well, you don't have to. I think it's good to look at dating as fun. Like dating is an opportunity to hang out with all different people and meet different kinds of people and maybe go to restaurants or do activities that you wouldn't normally do. And I think that trying to take the pressure off of like, is this my next husband? Like it might be, it might not be, but just think of it as like, it's always fun to ask somebody questions. Like, I feel like you can ask anything on a first date. You can say whatever you want to somebody on a first date, because if it doesn't go over well, you can just never see them again. And so just be like, this is fun. This is like an opportunity to like pick it like human psychology. And <laughs> that sounds so crazy. I don't mean it's that crazy, but it's just like, if you're curious about something about somebody, just ask them. And it's like, in what other social interaction can you do that? Really only dating. And so like, that's fun. I think, I think it's fun to ask people questions. I think women are really good at asking questions on dates. I've been on a few where a guy hasn't hasn't asked me any questions and that's probably one of my biggest pet peeves i mean no i went on i went on one date where the guy would like ask me a question and then he would answer it for me and that was that was the only date that i've been on since i got divorced not that like didn't go well but where i was uh, there was one other one that went like very very poorly but like i i didn't want to be around him so i started a fight uh which is not a cute thing to do you shouldn't do that but um i um there was one that was just, I he would just ask me a question and then he would answer it immediately. Um, and he wouldn't let me talk. And it, it, wait, 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 what, what do you mean? How does that pan out? You mean he would ask the question and then answer it like right, right away. What do you mean? Um, he was like, do you ski? And I said, Yes, I, I do. And then I was going to continue. And he was like, well, I always go to Aspen and this is where I go. And this is why Aspen's the best. And I'm sure you've never been to Aspen. But if you if you went, then this would be this. And he did that with everything, with everything. Um, and that was very irritating to me, but and like unpleasant. Generally, well, I kind of feel both ways. I, I do think if a guy doesn't ask me questions, it's not going to be like a, a long-term romantic connection, but I don't mind sitting and just listening to somebody because if somebody is like on, on something like, and they're just talking and talking, you can just like ask them any question and they'll answer it. And I always think that that's, that's always interesting to me. Like, I'm not, I'm not like, Oh, great. Like this guy talks and he's not interested in me at all. But I'm like, oh, this guy's very interested in him. Let's see if we can find the most interesting thing about him. You know, I, I just think it's like, yeah, it's not the most pleasant, but I don't know. Just ask them. Just ask them anything. You're making me feel so much more optimistic with this conversation, way more than I expected it to be. But um, I know we're on a time limit, so I'll let you go soon. But I'm trialing this new thing where I ask people their favorite self-care-ish activity, as in a self-care activity that could be perceived as selfish. So for example, I love pulling out of plans last minute. Um, I love to eat dinner by myself. Uh, I like to go out to dinner and sit at the bar and eat by myself. And sometimes I like to talk to people, but sometimes I like to just, I usually like to talk to people, but sometimes I like to talk to men. And a lot of the time I just like to just be be there. Um, and then I also, I, I don't know. I, um, I haven't worked out in about a month and a half cause I had a concussion. It's completely fine. Uh, but I, I really, I'm a big like workout person. Oh my God. I hope you're okay. Um, I love that you said you eat by yourself. Does that make you an introvert or are you an extrovert or an introverted extrovert? Cause you're outside. I think I might just be an extrovert. I think I might be like a I think we're rare, but I'm, I think I might be like a true extrovert. 
Um, I was talking to one of my friends about this the other day and he was like, no, we're both extroverts. He's like, it's weird. He's also a writer. He was like, it's weird because we're writers. But he was like, I think that we're both actually just only extroverted. Hey, oh my God, that's rare. I've never met a true extrovert. What's it like? (laughs) Extroverts are people too, I guess. Anyway, um, we are coming up to time and I think I might get back into my little introvert bubble. So I will release you and thank you so much for spending time with us on the show today. Thank you. But I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Is divorce glamorous these days or is it just a sign of the social media times and we're all just talking about it more? Leave me a voicemail at selfcare-ish.com.au or slide into my DMs on Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. And don't forget, please, please, please leave a review if you love the show. Just tap the three dots in Spotify or the stars on Apple Podcasts. Every time you do that, it helps. So thanks and I'll see you next week. (laughs) 